But let's pray and uh, ask the Lord to speak to us here. Uh, Father, we thank you that you've, you've spoken to us in your word. Thank you that, that there we can hear who you are, there you tell us who we are, there you tell us what, what our deepest problem is and how you, you solve it. And so, Father, today as we, we look at Psalm 51 and its backstory, we pray that we would be convicted by your spirit of our sin. Uh, we, pray that we pray that we would run with it, the only place we can run with it, to have it actually taken care of, which is to the cross of Jesus Christ. And so, so we pray that today we would leave that at your feet. We would trust that you've paid for it. We would believe that you rose again and conquered the death that we deserve. And, and we pray that we would leave here free, liberated from our sin because of what Jesus has done for us. Um, so Father, as we tell this story and, and we open this psalm, I pray that we would hear the story of Jesus in, in, on every page of Scripture. And we pray that we would be conformed to his likeness. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, well, during preparation this week, I decided to, to call an audible and change the preaching schedule a little bit. Um, we had originally said that we would do Psalm 51 this week and then Psalm 137 next week. Um, but there's a lot of richness in Psalm 51, including in the backstory to Psalm 51. So what I decided to do is actually spend this week and next week on Psalm 51. Um, um, this week, we'll mostly be telling the backstory of that psalm from 2 Samuel chapter 11. And then we'll skip over Psalm 137 for now, and we'll still do Psalm 139. Labor Day weekend, and then we'll jump into Galatians uh, for this fall and winter and work through that book together as a church. Um, but last week, we worked through Psalm 88, and Psalm 88 is a psalm of lament. It's a place where God gives language for the prayers of a person whose life is a wreck when it isn't his doing. And the psalmist described the, the loss of friends, the nearness to death, the silence of God, and, and darkness being his only companion. And this was all despite the fact that he was faithful. He was faithful to the Lord. He was one of God's people. He, he went to the Lord frequently, day and night in prayer. Um, but still, all kinds of sorrow came into his life. And God inspired that psalm, Psalm 88, to, to bring some hope that when those times of confusion and despair come into our lives, we know that we can bring them to him. We know that he hears those prayers. We, we know that he understands those things because he inspired those things in Scripture. And today, Psalm 51 is also a song for someone whose life is a wreck, but this time it is his fault. It's the song of someone who has, has sinned and sinned big, ruining not only his own life, but the lives of those around him. His sin brought dishonor to God's name. His sin brought harm to the kingdom of God. It brought all kinds of collateral damage. King David experienced a major fall. He had previously been a heroic leader. He, he was legitimately anointed by God to be the king. He had slain Goliath. He conquered enemies. He took the city of Jerusalem and established the worship of God there. He built a palace. He united the nation. He literally put Israel on the map, but now he had ruined it all. And in the aftermath, he sat and he wrote this psalm, which, which probably shows us the way to restoration better than any other passage in the Bible. And this is a song for us when we've fallen and when we need healing and restoration. And if we pray the Psalms, we'll likely pray this one again and again as we fall throughout our lives. And this Psalm does give real hope. It gives real hope for healing and restoration, that, that sin absolutely can ruin us. But this Psalm shows that there is a way forward so that it doesn't have to have the final word. And to really get this psalm, we, we need to know the story behind it. And your Bible probably has a caption at the beginning of this psalm that says something like, to the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And so, so in 2 Samuel 11, we have, have the story behind this psalm. In 2 Samuel 11, 1, it, it says, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, and David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. So it's springtime. 
David and the kings, they would typically go out to, to battle in the spring to fortify the kingdom. But this year, he decided to take the season off. He sent the soldiers out instead. Um, in fact, he sent all Israel, it says in verse 1. So probably all the able-bodied men in Israel went out to fight this battle while David stayed back for some meet time at the palace. So they're all out there fighting while he's at home resting. And, and then he falls into to this huge mess. And just a, a quick note for us here, for those, those of us who are, are striving for sexual integrity as, as Christians should be, one of the many facets of our strategy should be occupying our time working toward building something good. And the Bible definitely teaches us to rest, and it sets the rhythm for rest from the very beginning at work six days, rest one. But excess leisure time can bring with it excess aloneness with our thoughts, it can bring all forms of temptation, and whether it's the temptation toward self-pity, the temptation toward sexual temptation, temptations toward excessive worry and just doom-scrolling the socials, those things can all mount when we have time for those things. And so one of our strategies should be filling our time with worthwhile endeavors and building for the future so that we're working on something good. So we, we work on doing things like building into our families if we have families, or we work on college and on work, or we start businesses, or we serve the church and the community, we host a meal, we plant a garden, we spend our lives in good endeavors and then go to bed tired at night. If we just sit around and try not to sin, we won't stay out of trouble. And so here's David not occupying himself with worthwhile endeavors, and also he's not content at this point in his life, David has it all. I mean, he was, was married, he had a name for himself, he had achievements, he had wealth, he had security. We would look at what David had and what he had achieved in his life, and we'd say there's nothing more that anyone could ever want. That guy should be content, that guy should be satisfied, but he still wanted more because the world doesn't satisfy. And whatever we've attained or haven't attained yet, we need to be cultivating a deep contentment in the life that God's given us. It's not the kind of contentment that doesn't work to, to change things that are bad or that doesn't work to produce more good. We should always have like a certain discontent with our holiness, with our walks with God. We want to grow. We want to change. We want to be better. But we should have a contentment that says the life that God has given me is enough for me to have real joy. Jeremiah Burroughs, who was a minister in England in the 1630s, wrote a book called The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. It's usually for sale for like a buck on Kindle. It's definitely worth reading. And, and he calls contentment that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. So it's like this deep satisfaction and peace about the life that God's given you. And it's a joy in, in God's will for you. We're called to cultivate that kind of deep satisfaction in God. And Paul actually says we can learn it. In Philippians 4.11, he says, Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So being content means that we stop looking for more for me because I have enough for me. It means dying to the daydreams of, of a different life dying to some of the other possibilities that could be ours if we weren't so faithful to the responsibilities God's given us. And it's absolutely worth asking ourselves if our use of social media is feeding our discontent. And this is no like law against using social media. I know that we can use it to deepen meaningful connections. There, there's, there's good that can come from it. But we also need to ask ourselves if, if scrolling through it all the time is just fueling a discontent, fueling a jealousy, fueling daydreams of, of another life. We might be using it for good, but we also might be just kind of using it to walk on the roof of our palace and, and scan for something that could be a little bit better. And so David here isn't pursuing the endeavors that he should be pursuing. He isn't content. He's out looking for more. He's also away from accountability. The, the guys are all off in battle, so he's mostly alone in the palace. And he goes for a walk on the roof, and he sees off in the distance a woman bathing. I've read some people who wrote that she was trying to seduce him, but, but I don't see any evidence in the Bible for that, in the text, in the story, um, in, in the bathing rituals of that day. It seems like she was just taking a bath. And, and if, if she had done something wrong, you would think that we would have heard about that somewhere in the text. David would have made that clear as he described what happened. But she was probably just engaged in a common bathing ritual, and David was sinfully peeping through the foliage on his roof. <laughs> 
And so David sees her, and he sends messengers to find out who she is. And, and one comes back and says, she's Bathsheba, and she's the wife of Uriah. Now, David knew Uriah. Pretty soon we'll see that Uriah was a man of very high integrity. He's listed as one of the mighty men of David. He's a guy who constantly put his life on the line for David. He was basically part of David's secret service. He was a deeply loyal friend to David. And David obviously wouldn't take his wife because David has everything. Uriah doesn't have much. He, he has his wife, and you would just have to be a total scum to steal your friend's wife. But David doesn't care. He calls for her, she comes to him, and he takes her to bed. Now, some in reading this text have said that this was, was forcible, but the Bible had words for rape that weren't used here. Um, but, but then on the other hand, this isn't just simple adultery, as wicked as that would be. I mean, this is the king, and the king gets to take what he wants. And so, so whether she was a willing participant or not, there's certainly a power dynamic at play here that makes it incredibly difficult to say no to the king. And, and there is the possibility in this text that it is the worst case scenario. We'll see in a second that David is in a state where he's willing to murder, so certainly he might be willing to, to mistreat Bathsheba in the worst of all possible ways. And so regardless of, of some of the nuances here, this is really bad. This is worse than adultery. It's sexual abuse. It's abuse of power. But David didn't care. David only cared about David. His only concern was what he wanted, regardless of the destruction that it caused for everybody else, and he took what he wanted. But then Bathsheba sends this message. Sends the message to David, and she says, I'm pregnant. And so now David is caught. This is going to look terrible. The king steals his loyal friend's wife. This man after God's own heart as he had been called, was, was after something else. This king would be known to be a wicked man now. I'm sure the loyalty in his ranks would be broken. How dare you treat one of our fellow soldiers like this? His image of perfection is going to be completely shattered. This is a bad day for him. And then David decides to cover it all up. So he calls for Uriah, he has him come home, he winds him, he dines him, tells him, go home to your wife, go home, relax, wash your feet, just, just go home, have a good time, gives him a couple days to do that. He, he figures that Uriah will go home, will sleep with his wife, he'll think the baby is his, and the cover-up will be complete. But Uriah, even after the king successfully gets him drunk, refuses to go home. He refuses to enjoy the pleasures that his men on the front lines can't enjoy right now. So notice this contrast here. David is not going to battle. And while his men are out there risking their lives on the front line for his kingdom, he's stealing their wives. Uriah refuses to even go home and see his wife when his men are on the front line. So Uriah is all integrity. David is all lust and craftiness. So his plan fails. And, and with plan A a failure, he goes with an even more atrocious plan B. So 2 Samuel 11, verse 14, it says, In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and die. So David calls Uriah in and he says, All right, time for you to go back to battle. Do me a favor, carry this sealed letter to Joab, the commander. So he's got such confidence in the integrity of Uriah that he knows Uriah is not going to open that letter. He's not going to take a peek and see what that's all about. He knows that this guy is sound. He would never betray him that way. And so he uses that against him, puts it in his hand, says, take it to the captain of the army. The captain gets it, has no idea what's going on, but he has to do what the king says. And so he sets it all up that way. Uriah goes out to battle. The other people who are fighting with him pull back, and he's killed. And so, so Joab, the captain, I'm sure is upset by this. Like, why would the king tell me to do these things? Why would he tell me to do these things to Uriah, of all people? And David's response in verse 25 is, David said to the messenger, Thus shall you say to Joab, Do not let this matter displease you, for the sword devours one and now another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. So David, obviously just so hard in his heart at this point, says, Joab, be encouraged. These things happen. I mean, it's a war. 
Some people get devoured in the war, then other people get devoured in the war. There's no I have sinned. There's just a callous, man, yeah, stuff happens sometimes. So he blames the circumstances. He insults Joab's intelligence because the biggest thing for David is that he has to manage his image at all costs. The only thing that he's feeling here is a threat to his ego. So verse 26, it says, when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she lamented over her husband. And when the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. And so now at this point, the plan has worked flawlessly. Uriah is gone, and news starts spreading throughout the kingdom about the kindness of David. Because look what he did. Here, here's Bathsheba, and she's weeping and wailing because her husband is lost. And, and so David goes, in his kindness, to this bereaved widow who's now destitute. And he says, you're not going to be destitute. So he marries her. They raise her son, start to raise her son as a prince. They're, they're going to, to, to make royalty out of this line. And what a great guy King David is. What, what a nice man to do that. David looks so good in this whole thing. He's the hero of the story to most of the observers. He's a little bit of a savior. He, he schemed his way out of his sin, but it worked. He's come out on top. He's gotten what he wanted. He looks great, and nobody needs to know. But that's not where verse 27 ends. The rest of verse 27 says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. David thought that he had managed the situation. He thought he had managed perceptions and made everything turn out just right for himself. But the Lord saw it. And the Lord was displeased. And this is big. Because we believe that God is just, we can know for sure that nobody gets away with anything ever. And none of us are the exception to that. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Numbers 32.23 says, Be sure your sin will find you out. David thought he had schemed his way out. He thought he had talked his way out. He thought he would removed the threats. He thought he got what he wanted. But the Lord was displeased, and his sin would find him out. It's also worth noting here that, that David actually was like a real lover of God. 1 Samuel 13, 14 called him a, man's after, a man after God's own heart, and it wasn't lying. He really did love the Lord. He wrote inspired words and sang inspired songs. He was used by God. He was chosen by God. He genuinely loved him. He knew God's attributes. He wrote songs that celebrated what God was like. He genuinely led the nation toward knowing the Lord. And this is how far he sank. He had this calloused heart. And he had a deep and dangerous failure to fear the Lord. So it's a warning for us that, that if he could fall that far, we could too. And somehow he convinced himself that he was the exception, that he could manage this, that he would be the one who really got away with it. And we do this too. We'll say, you know, I know this thing is wrong, but it'll work for me. I'm going to be the one who makes disobeying the Lord go well. I mean, lesser people than me, they haven't been able to manage the consequences of their sin, but I can manage it. I can make it work. I'm on top of this. I got this. But doing what displeases the Lord never works. Never works ultimately. We don't know how many months of peace David got after orchestrating this whole plan, but it turns out he was not the maestro that he thought he was. He wasn't able to conduct his life toward the outcome he wanted and manage his image to perfection because the Lord was displeased. And so the Lord sends a prophet to David, the prophet Nathan. And he was a guy who'd been faithful to speak the word of the Lord to David in the past, even a hard word of the Lord. At one point, David thought, I want to build a house for God. And, and Nathan says, no, God hasn't told you to do that. It actually contradicts the king. He was the guy who would speak hard things to the king. And so he comes to him now in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1, and he tells him this parable. It says, and the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the, rich one, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. 
It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So David says, that kind of injustice happened in my kingdom? A guy with one lamb loses his lamb because a rich guy doesn't want to sacrifice one lamb from his flock? I mean, who would do that kind of thing? That, that is absolutely appalling. That man needs to die, and he needs to pay back fourfold for that lamb that he took. Verse 7, Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what's evil in his sight? You've struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you've taken his wife to be your wife, and you've you've killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. So Nathan describes this judgment that's coming from God. There's going to be huge pain that's brought into David's life. There will be no peace in his house again, and and the child will die. So notice a couple of things here. First of all, look at Nathan's courage to go and correct David. I mean, Nathan knew better than anyone that David was not in a good place. David was on this murderous terror, and he was only thinking about himself. He had just had this loyal friend killed to keep his secret. So what what should Nathan expect? Nathan goes into David and exposes to him that he knows that secret too. I mean, his life is definitely at risk. David easily could have said to Nathan, hey, Nathan, do me a favor here. Take this note and, and bring this to Joab. Just trust me on this one. He could have done the same thing. So it took some courage for him to come and correct this guy who was not in a good place. And honestly, it will for us at times too. Sometimes we see a brother or sister in a fault and and we want to see them restored, but we know they're in a bad place. We know that they're just bringing harm to people all around them. We know that they're slandering people who come and correct them. We know that they're going to say terrible things about us. But we're called to courage. Courage enough to take a risk and to say a hard thing to a brother or sister, especially someone who is destroying their lives through sin. So James 5.19, he says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. So it's a good mission for us to be on to correct our brothers and sisters when we see them in grievous sin, but it does take courage. Notice also here that I mean, David's life was an absolute mess. He turned his whole life into a dumpster fire. He was lustful and murderous and abusive. You couldn't say enough bad things about David at this point. But still, by God's grace, there was at least the humility to allow Nathan's correction. He was at least open to that. Shows there was at least that little bit of hope left in him. This is big. I think Christian leaders especially sometimes can be told that we should never listen to any critics. And and you understand, you get frequently criticized and opposed any time you're trying to build anything good. And and we'll hear all the time how how all these critics who are coming to us, they're all just haters, so ignore all the haters. And, And to a degree, it is true. Leaders should ignore the people who only criticize. They should ignore people who only tear down but never build. They should ignore people who only speak to them when they have a problem. But the big risk is that we start to treat everybody like a hater. We make ourselves immune to any correction. And anybody who would challenge me or correct me or kindly call me back to belief must be an enemy. But then we miss out on so much of what God has made the body of Christ to be for us. We miss out on so much growth. We don't learn from those people that God sends to keep us on the right path. 
So we have to have people that we will allow to speak even hard words into our lives. And it's good to identify them now before you, you think you need the correction. There, there are definitely plenty of haters to ignore, but that isn't everybody. We should all have people in our lives who are like Nathan, who have spoken the word to us before, who have shown their wisdom before, who have shown their good heart to us before, who've been partners and friends, who, who need to have an open door to come in and say to us, you're not okay. What you're doing is not okay. The Lord is displeased. We need to cultivate those friendships and identify those Nathans in our lives so that we have people who are wise in God's word, who are godly, and who have our permission to call us to repentance at any time. People who, if they ever come to me and say to me that I'm wrong, I'm at least going to press pause on what I'm doing and consider what they're saying because they've proven themselves. David needed this. David had a genuine relationship with God, and if he could fall this far, and if he could need this, then who am I to assume that I don't need it? If David needed a Nathan in his life, I certainly do too. So Nathan corrects David, and and David repents. Verse 13 says, David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who was born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. And according to that caption on Psalm 51, this is the moment that David writes Psalm 51 as his psalm of repentance. And and we know that what happens in David's heart here is sincere, that it gets to the root of the problem, because Nathan says that God put away his sin. And so, so again, we're just going to do a very shallow dive into the first part of this psalm today. We won't spend a ton of time in it today. We'll spend all of next week in it. But we've got to look first at just these two realizations that David had that put him on that road to redemption. And so Psalm 51, verses 1 through 6, it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. There's a lot to his repentance that we'll unpack next week, but the two major realizations that you can see today that David had were he came to realize the dreadfulness of his sin and he came to realize the mercy of God. I mean, first, he completely owned his sin now. Notice how he talks about it. He talks about my transgressions, my iniquity, my sin. He says, I have done evil. He doesn't blame anybody else here. There's no mention of Bathsheba. There's no mention of, well, yeah, can you really blame me? Of course I fell. There's no mention that that life has been hard. There's no mention of his needs. He completely owns what he does, and he calls it sin. There's no self-pity. He doesn't use euphemisms to soften the sin or make it seem not so bad. This is a real heart change. It's a heart change from, you know, these things happen, to I have sinned. And this is an important part for us to be on that path to healing and restoration and redemption is for us to see the problem as God sees it and call it what God calls it without softening it at all. Now, this isn't a denial that sins have some other like causes that come alongside us that where, where parts of them don't come just from inside our hearts. There are certainly temptations that come our way. There are certainly occasions for our sins. There are even things that have happened to us that make us prone to certain sins. But ultimately, we still own the sins. The big reason that I sin is me. And the one who's the most offended is God. Verse 4, he says, I've sinned against you and you only, which is weird because he certainly sinned against Bathsheba. He wasn't exactly nice to Uriah. In all kinds of ways, it seemed like he sinned against a lot of people, but he recognizes that everybody is made in the image of God. And to sin against a person is to sin against God. He doesn't just have to get some things right with the people around him. Ultimately, he has to get things right with God. His sin is a betrayal 
of the Lord. David didn't just break a moral code. He didn't just disappoint himself. He didn't just fail to live up to his own standards. He cheated on God. He betrayed his Savior. And David sensed the seriousness of that. So do we? Or do we just try to explain ours away? Yeah, I sinned because they sinned against me. Or, yeah, yeah, I'm an angry person, but my dad was angry, so that's how I'm going to be. Or do we not even have a category for sin? We don't want to talk about it because it feels so harsh. But Scripture talks about the sin that breaks our relationship with God as our biggest problem. And those consequences couldn't be more serious. I think sometimes we just treat it like it's not a big deal. We shrug it off lightly and we say, yeah, you know, we're all sinners. I'm glad God will forgive me. But David felt the weight of it. He sees his sin. He calls it what God calls it. He doesn't soften his words at all. He says, this is me. I've done evil. But then the other thing that he sees, the other thing that he knows, and that he totally throws himself upon is the mercy of God. Verse 1, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. When he says God has this steadfast love, he uses the Hebrew word hesed, which is a devoted love. It's a covenant love. It's the kind of love you pledge when you marry someone, where you say, for better or for worse, I'm going to be with you. I'm committed to you. That's what love is. Paul Miller calls this one-way love or a love without an exit strategy. It's the kind of love that causes you to bind yourself to another person, even if it means you lose out on the deal. And David says, I can't say enough how wicked I've been, but I also know that you're a God of mercy who pursues us with devoted love. You're a God who loves wicked people like me. You're a God who loves at great cost. So I'm not making light of anything that I've done, but I also can't make light of your mercy and your loving kindness. I believe that there's enough of that in you, God, for someone who's fallen like I've fallen. And again, even though there's a lot more to repentance in this psalm that we're going to unpack next week, David knew two things that we need to know. The seriousness of his sin and the abundant loving kindness and mercy of God. And he also knew that rather than running away from God in his shame, he should run toward God and throw himself on God's mercy. Ligon Duncan points out that there are some similarities between David and and the prodigal son. Where, where the prodigal son goes out, he, he squanders all of his father's wealth, comes to his senses, and he says, I don't deserve to be called a son. And he says, my father's compassionate. So he returns to his father, and he says, I don't deserve to be called a son. Make me a servant. But his father, in his compassion, throws a ring on his finger, has a steak dinner, and a huge party to celebrate his return. So David says, I don't deserve forgiveness. There's nothing in me that has earned your love. I couldn't be worse than how I've behaved. But I know that God in you, there's mercy. I know there's loving kindness. And I'm just going to throw myself on that, knowing that that's my only hope. In this side of the cross of Jesus, we can look back and see those two things even more clearly. We can see the greatness of our sin and the love and mercy of God on full display in the cross of Jesus. I mean, first, when when Jesus is on the cross, we can look up there and see the greatness of our sin. We can see the gore and the trauma of the cross all showing how serious our sin is and how great the wrath of God is for our sin. We're, We're worse than we think we are if that's what a fitting punishment for our sin looks like. But we also see the love and the mercy of God in the same place. I mean, how much must he love to send his son to die for us like that? What kind of love compels the father to send his son to be given for us in that way? How merciful must he be? How much must he desire to welcome us back into fellowship? How much is he the father in the story of the prodigal son who wants to put the ring on our finger, who wants to put the robe on our back, who wants to throw the party, who wants to have the dinner? We have a God who's loving in mercy and who has pursued us with that mercy in Jesus. 
John Newton, who had been a slave trader and, and finally came to a place of repentance from, from his evil practices, went on to write the lyrics of the song Amazing Grace. And, and he said toward the end of his life, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I'm a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. Those are the two things that David knew that sent him running to God. And in the Lord's Supper that we're about to eat, these two truths are symbolized, that I'm a great sinner and I have a great savior. Scripture says that when we eat this supper, we do it to show the Lord's death until he comes. And his death happened because I'm really that bad, and his death happened because he's really that loving. So we eat the bread saying that I needed the body of Christ to be torn for me. We drink the cup saying I needed the blood of Christ to be spilled for me. And we eat and drink saying God is so faithful and so loving that at great cost, he died to redeem us. He's so good that he sent his son to die. He's so merciful that even though that mercy had to be paid for with the death of his son because he's also a God of justice and nobody gets away with anything, he did pay for it. And so we take this supper on the one hand, confessing our sins and our failures, but then on the other hand, rejoicing that we're approaching God because of what he did, that what Jesus accomplished really is enough for us. So we'll invite today everyone here who is a Christian, who's, who's really come to faith in Christ, who trusts in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, and that alone for our forgiveness and for the only reason that we can approach God. And also people who have confessed all of our known sins, who are saying, I, I've renounced these things. I've thrown these things at the foot of the cross. When we take this, this supper, we're all saying, I'm a great sinner, but I've been saved by a great Savior. And so if that's you and you're saying those things and believing those things and you've confessed your known sin, we would invite you as we sing the next couple songs to come in and to take this supper with us. If you're not there yet, if you don't yet believe those things, if you don't believe that you're a Christian, or if you know that you're living in a wrong way, that you're committed to a wrong course of action and you're not willing to turn from it and confess it and renounce it, we would actually urge you to stay in, in your seat for this part. But in taking this supper, we're, none of us are saying, I've been perfect, I've been good enough to be worthy of God. We're all saying that what Jesus Christ did on that cross is what purchased my worthiness. And I do approach God and I do approach him boldly as a son or a daughter because of his mercy. So let's take a minute now just to kind of silently confess our sins to God and then I'll close us in prayer and then we'll stand and worship and you're welcome to take the supper uh, during the next couple songs.